chapter 5, 22 and 23. And behold, there cometh one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jerish by name, and when he saw him, he fell at his feet and besought him greatly, saying, he's speaking to Jesus here, he says, My little daughter lieth at the point of death. I pray thee, come and lay thy hands on her, that she may be healed, and she shall live. Now look down at verse 35. And now here he's, uh, Jesus was speaking, and then, and this ruler was with him. He was on his way to, little girl, to the house. And, and the verse says, While he yet spake, while Jesus spake, there came from the ruler of the synagogue's house certain, which said, Thy daughter is dead. Why troublest thou the master any further? And verse 36 says, As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he saith unto the ruler of the synagogue, Be not afraid, only believe. Right at that point, that, that ruler, there isn't a mountain I can imagine any parent face than that, bigger than that. The worst thing you could imagine. And I, and I, and I, and I pray that nothing like that would happen to, to, to you or your, your families or anything. But, but this is a mountain, kind of the worst of mountain. And you face all the mountains the same way. These words he says right there. When the mountain comes up, when the problem comes up, when the financial or physical or, or whatever it is that's in front of you, the first, let those words ring in your mind. What Jesus says, be not afraid, only believe. Now, it's a simple formula to face the greatest of the mountains. Now, be not afraid. Fear is Satan's premier weapon. And he loves to try to make you think, I can't do it. I got to give up. I, I'm not the right person for this. I'm not good enough. I, whatever it is, he comes up. You know, we, we've all given Satan this long list of things of things we've done in our life that he can use against us. But the point, what God says, when you ask forgiveness for God, He forgives you and He forgets it. That's something, folks. If so, if you get reminders in your head, there, that isn't God reminding you. So. Satan can make it look bad, but I want to tell you something God can do. He can take a curse and make it into a blessing. It looks bad, but God can turn it around. Uh, so it's important here, you look at this thing. This is, a, this is principle number one. Be not afraid, only believe. You know, be not afraid means don't listen to Satan, only believe. Trust in the Lord. That's what God wants you to do. You're his children. He wants you to do that. Um, well, now there's mountains of uh, money mountains. Now, I often thought about this is probably something Satan made up, you know, money mountains. But uh, the second principle I want you to understand here is God doesn't care about the money. He does care about your attitude toward the money. Now, we put way too much importance on the financial we do. Not that, not that you should be disrespectful about that or just you know, throw the money around. But the point here is that what God looks at and praying about money or whatever, God isn't, it isn't about the money. It's how he feels your attitude is about it. Now, when we were early in our ministry, we went on a, uh, we'd go on deputation, go from church to church. And when you go to a, a church and you make a presentation, you tell them about the ministry, they usually give you an offering to get you on to the next place. That's kind of the purpose of the offering, get you to the next place you're going, and then you go on to the next place, and that's how missionaries get around the country. And So we went to this one church. It was up in, uh, I, don't want, I don't want to give too much description. Where it was I? Don't want anybody to know where this was. But anyway, uh, it was a pretty good-sized church, maybe 130-so people on the, in the church. They were a church that had gone on a mission trip. Uh, and also in that town, there was another church there. Some kids from the church came on a mission trip in El Paso. And uh, when I got there, uh, I, we were staying at the pastor's house. We, I was going to speak Sunday night. So Sunday morning, uh, we had a wonderful service. I, the pastor gave his message. And, and so Sunday afternoon, it was just a beautiful day. Way out in farm country, you know, it was pretty. And I was kind of walking around out there just... Uh, enjoying this, and the pastor came walking on. He says, uh, Brother Jarvis, I just want to let, let you know, uh, tonight's service, he said, 
whatever the offering is, I'm going to give that to you. Now, that's an unusual thing to say because most pastors don't exactly know what's going to come in the offering. And he said, and this is a little bit special tonight because uh, we have a church across town who are friends of ours. And once a month, they come here for a Sunday night service with us. And once a month, we go there for a Sunday night service with them. I said, I'm really impressed. I didn't know Baptist churches would ever do anything like that, you know, come together. And, uh, and I said, well, I, I, that, 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 that's, you know, okay. I, that's good. I didn't know what to say. You know, I was kind of, uh, you know, he starts talking about the money. That isn't why I was on deputation. It's, somebody said something like that. So I got that night. And uh, like I said, that church he was talking about, was they had kids from that church that was on a mission trip uh, the previous summer, and the kids from that. So those kids in that church told all their friends and the people in the church, you need to come here and listen to our friend Brother Jarvis speak. You need. So that night, the church was packed all the way to there, like 300 people. They opened up the back doors, and they had a uh, kind of a little entry airway, and they had chairs backed out all the way out, and it was just packed with people. And so the night I gave this sermon, and man, everybody was excited, and people were weeping, and, and they're just going, and then after I sat down, and the pastor gets up, and he said, we need to support these guys. They're doing God's work. This money's going to go for God, and you need to give and pay these people. I'm, I'm looking down, thinking, I don't want to think about the money. I don't want to think. I'm not thinking about my, my money. And, and his offering plates go, full of money and everything. So right after this thing, they had a, uh, um, a fellowship. So all the people are there, and I'm going around talking to different people, and, and I, I'm enjoying it. It was just maybe 10 or 15 minutes in the fellowship. I heard a little scream and looked over, and the pastor is laying on the floor. Wow. Well, so I walked over, I went over there, and the people kind of gathered around him, and they kind of hauled him. His house was right across the street there, and got him over there, called a doctor, and he, was, uh, he passed out. And he wakes up, and he's looking at me, and I, my family was there with me, and my daughter Krista had her violin, was standing, still holding the violin, and he looked at her, and he said, did you play the violin tonight? And she said, yes. And he said, oh, man, I don't remember that. And he looked at me and said, did you preach tonight? I said, yes. And he goes, man, I don't remember that. And oh, oh, I said, well, uh, you know, I hope you feel better. You know, and so the doctor says, well, you just need to get some rest, and you know, it should be fine by tomorrow. So we, he stayed there, and you know, we were staying at the pastor's house. My family was, and all of us were there. And uh, they, I think my, this was early, and I think my son was like 13, and they were kind of up that age group there, 13, 16, 17. And so at the, in the morning, we got up, and the pastor's wife met us and said, you know, we're Pastor Tony to tell you, really glad you came. Thank you so much. Goodbye. Aww. So we, we go into the, we get, out, we get in the car, and we're driving away. And so I'm driving down the road, and I can hear this giggling in the back seat. You know, these three kids are talking to each other. And I said, okay. I said, I want everybody to listen up very carefully here. I don't want anybody. I don't want to talk about this. There's nothing good that's going to come out of any conversation of it. We didn't do anything wrong, and we're going to just go for it. God is the one who takes care of us, so we're not going to talk about or say anything bad about this. So we go to the next church, which was, I think that was a Sunday, the Wednesday. And... Uh, the church was a pretty small church, and uh, they, the pastor was actually upset because his son, the youth pastor, is the one who invited me to come and speak that night, and the pastor didn't know it. So when I showed up, I was like, who are you? You know what? So the pastor was irritated, but he let me speak, and, and he was irritated with his son. So I think the, I talked a total of 30 seconds with this pastor, including the phone call. When I first called, told him I was coming. I what? Well, oh, talk to my son. You know, anyway, uh, so we, we get to the ser services, like maybe 20, 25 people or something were there. And uh, he's pastor stands up and he says, um, okay, we need to take, this one, take our love offering. So he took a love offering. And then he read some announcements. He says, okay, he says, uh, Brother Jarvis is going to come up and speak. And after he speaks, we're going to take a special love offering for him. He said, and then, uh, and then you know, that's what's going to happen tonight. So he goes and sits down. So I get up and I preach, and they responded really well, you know, and so I'm getting ready to leave, and, and the pastor, um, pastor walks up to me during this thing, and he has his envelope, and he said, 
I took the love offering, any checks was, put all in one, put it in the church account. Here's one check for you. Thank you very much for coming. And he, I said goodbye as he was walking away. And he, uh, and so I put that in my pocket, and I talked a little bit more to people. And we get in the car, we're on our way back home. And uh, I think I, I heard this comment out of the back seat. So did we get a love offering? I said, yes, we got a love offering. They said, can we see it? And so I took it out, and I handed it back. I did, it was an envelope. And I heard this, Dad, there's $750 in here. I said, what? And I said, OK, everybody, stop and listen for a minute. Here's what happened. <laughs> we didn't complain about the money from the other church, and God made it up here. God can do that because we didn't complain. Real important, missionaries, I want to tell you something. You don't complain about anything. God is the one supporting you. That's the thing you got to keep in mind. God is the one carrying you through this. If the church, you know, every church, not every church has to support you. I mean, you'd like that, but they don't do it. It doesn't mean they're a bad church. If the church, if God wants a church to support you, he will turn the heart of the pastor and the people to do it. And if he doesn't, then he will continue to take care of you. That's the way it works. And you got to keep that in mind. And God loves it when you honor him by being a Christian when it comes to things like that. God doesn't want you to complain. He doesn't want you to grumble and talk about that. I mean, ha. he doesn't want you to do this. So with God, it's not about the money. So uh, that's important to, uh, to keep that in mind so that the, the, the principle here, principle number, did I say that? Principle, not afraid to be, okay. So principle, it's not about the money. He wants you to, uh, to trust him. Okay. The next one. Oh, let me tell you another. We had a, in regard to the money. We have a, uh, when I was a uh, uh, missionary back there, one, when I, my, some of my support one time, this one guy, uh, they called me and they said, um, hey, Brother Jarvis, this one guy gave your, your ministry $2,700 in stock. Or no, excuse me, $3,000 in stock. And, and, and I said, really? I said, that's great. I said, because my kids were going to college during that time. And by the way, God paid for my kids going through college. Um, that's another really long story, but not a person did. But we, we prayed and prayed and prayed. And every month, he came up with $2,000 to keep him in college for about four and a half years. Um, anyway, I said, that's wonderful because I, I got to pay this $2,700 bill. And, and the person who was telling me said, well, when do you have to pay that? Now, this was about the 8th of January. And I said, i got to pay it on the 18th of January. And he said, well, we just got this in, our, in the mail. He said, uh, what we have to do is sell the stock, get the check, and then send it to you. By that time, you're probably not going to get it until February 1st. I said, well, then I guess I have more to pray about then, don't I? He said, well, yeah. So he hangs up the phone. And then he couldn't stand it. He was worried about all, uh, me, I guess. And so he calls me back about two days later and says, look, we know you got the money. We got the stock right here. So what the ministry is going to give you a check for $2,700 so you can pay that bill on the 18th. And then when, whenever we get this money for the stock back, then we'll just take it out of that. And I said, OK, that's fine. Well, now, when the guy gave him the stock, he said, the stock is not stable. He says, I can't tell you what to do with the stock, but I suggest you try to sell it immediately. And they said, oh, OK, well, they didn't do that. They didn't, weren't, they didn't know anything about stock or anything. And so they kind of messed around for about two weeks. And the stock started going like this. They finally sold it. So I get a call from the one guy. And he says, hey, he says, we sold that stock. And we only got $2,100. He said, I gave you $2,700. You have to pay the rest of it back. It's not my fault. I didn't mean that. It wasn't my fault. That happened. I didn't know. And I said, it's all right. So my wife and I, it was interesting because we had to talk about this, and we laughed about it. It was really pretty funny. They, were, they, didn't, they just didn't do what they were supposed to do. So now I had a choice. I could get mad at these guys and say, man, I lost $900 because these guys didn't do what they were supposed to do. And they were, you know, they were church people. You know, they didn't really hadn't dealt with stock. Or I could say, thank you, Lord, because I didn't have nothing to start with, and I had $2,100 there. So we laughed about it and said, thank you, Lord, for the $2,100. And I told him, we'll pay the money back. Don't worry. 
Now, how do you think God thought about that? I want you just because uh, looking at it from the perspective of God as being a Christian again, which is Christ-like, we all know that. Well, a week later, we were driving through Kentucky, and we stopped at this church. They had a prophet's chamber. A lot of times we stop places that have prophet's chambers when we're traveling. And it was a Tuesday. They didn't have a meeting or anything. We were just stopping for the night. And some of the people there, I knew the people in the church, and several of them knew we were there and stopped, came in to see us just for an hour or so. And there's uh, several men there talking. I was talking to them, and one of them gave me a green handshake. That's when they... The handshake, you can feel they have money or something in there. You know, that's kind of, um, and so I, it was kind of a little packet thing. And I, and I figured it was probably money, and I, I didn't know what it was. And I, but I told the guy, I said, no, you don't need to do it. We're just going through here. I'm not even going to speak. And he said, that's OK. I just want to be a blessing. That's all he said. And there's several other men there. So it was a little packet. And I just took it and stuck it in my pocket and finished talking to him. Later, we got back to our room that night, opened up the packet. And there were 10 $100 bills in there. God gave the money back. He didn't care about the $900 I had lost. And by the way, he gave me back 900 because he knew I was going to tithe 100 of that 1,000. And he gave me $900 back because I didn't complain about it. I did, God says, I can I can." own the cattle in a thousand hills. I can make up money. I can bring in places you never imagined. Uh, and people would say, whenever I ever tell money stories sometimes of how God provided, people say, well, I don't know people who have money. Well, neither do I, but God does. <laughs> he comes up with them. So, so one of the things that uh, God wants you to, wants you to not remember the money, you have, to, it, it is something, it's God's attitude toward the money is that your, wants your attitude to be right. All right, principle number three is to be thankful always. We were traveling one time, and uh, we had a car. We had uh, a lot of cars, a lot of car stories. But station wagon, man, those station wagons. Love them, man, old station wagons, man. I was driving it somewhere halfway between Texas and uh, Colorado. And uh, down the interstate, and all of a sudden, you heard just kind of a whoosh, and a bunch of oil went up on the windshield. I blew the engine. And that's pretty much does the car in. I didn't know that. At the time, till somebody came and told me, the only thing you do is just sell your car. And, and uh, so I said, the guy, the tow truck guy, I said, well, who, you know, somebody I could sell it to? And he goes, yeah, I do. So the guy, co guy comes up and he says, I'll buy it for 50 bucks. I said, 50 bucks? I just bought, put new tires on the car a month ago. And he said, well, that's why I'm giving you 50 bucks. I wouldn't give you anything. Uh, so, so what we did is we went over to that car, family did the hand on that hood and said, God, thank you for the miles that you gave us on this car. It was a blessing. We appreciate that, God. Thank you for that. Now, as it worked out, we had to rent a car. We got back home. Uh, there was a missionary on the property there who was selling a car. Actually, it was identical to the one I had, only a one year newer, same color even. But anyway, and he said, He'd sell it to me for $1,000. And I said, well, that's great. I had, a, I had $1,000 in savings. I said, you got, I can help you out by buying the car. And he said, well, I'm not keeping the money for myself. I'm giving my money to a national pastor in Mexico so that he can get a car. And I said, well, that's great. I had a problem with my car. I had to buy your car, and I can help this national pastor. And which seemed like that wasn't quite the end of the story, because then about several days later, I received this letter from someone who had no idea what's going on up there. Gave me $1,000 because they felt led to do it. I didn't even give back the money for that. God blesses you when you're thankful. Doesn't like complaining. I mean, this is a privilege to serve God. All right. Now, the fourth one, fourth principle. It's not the car that gets you to your destination. It's God who gets you there. And I want to tell you something. And you know, we've had, we had cars. One time a guy told me down in El Paso, I was ready to take this trip. And he says, I wouldn't, my master mechanic, he's a good mechanic. He says, I wouldn't take this car out of the county. You got some problems with transmission. And I said, well, you know, I told the Lord years back, I'd never borrow money for a car or borrow money for anything. So Lord, if you give me the money, I'll buy a new car. If you don't, that means it's okay with you that I take the car that I got. I didn't get the money, so got in that car, tune, took off for our trip. And our trip was El Paso to Florida to up to Minnesota, state of Washington, and back to El Paso again. That was the trip. 
And on the way, by the way, part of that trip, about 300 of those miles, I traveled without brakes. Oh, really? I trust God there. And then it was, uh, and by the time, and I, the car actually ran better when I got back than when I started. And after I got back, just about a week or so, after, no, within, the, within the two weeks of the time I got back, a guy called me up and gave me his car. Now, God could have done that before I left, but he didn't. He was showing me it wasn't the car that was going to get me there. It was him. We, we, put a, we put a trust in things. It's God can make an old car like that run whether it likes it or not. So it's not the car to get you. It's also not the passport that gets you across the border. That's another thing. You know, we had down El Paso. I mean, American guards are really pretty tough on that now. You try to come back in the U.S. I had these five girls that they... Uh, when we, when, we go, when we go across the border, we always on the bus, we always tell everybody, if you got your passport, and they all go, yeah, see, we got a passport. Okay, look at it. Because someone will look, oh, I don't have it. Oh, I thought I had it. And they run in and get it. And so we get over there, and we're coming back, and these five girls come up to me and said, we don't have our passports. And I said, didn't you look before we left? They said, no, we didn't look because we knew we had them. Anyway, so they're standing, what are we going to do? And they're terrified. And I said, look, it's not passport that gets you across the border. It's God. Now, just stay with me, and I'll talk to the guard. And so it's, I was about ready to go up to the guard, and they're kind of bumping up behind me. I said, look, relax. Back up a little bit, you know. So I, I walked up to the garden and I told them these girls, and they were 14-year-old girls. There's not much about them that looks terroristic. So, uh, and he kind of looked at them. I said, they forgot their passports. And he said, okay, you, come on. Come on. He come over. First one up, he says, state your citizenship citizenship. She said, you asked her to go. You. State your, and went there, all five of them. They're all jumping around. Yes, oh God, took us across. It's just wonderful. Because it isn't the passport. Even one time which me, always telling everybody, there was a time I forgot mine. I put it in my pocket because I was driving the truck at that time. I, and I, you show it right there and I didn't have time to put it in my wallet so I just stuck it in my pocket. Forgot about it. Took the shirt off, threw it in the laundry. Give it to Mexico the next day. Then I realized... I don't have my passport. And I'm usually the last one in line, and one of the young worker guys that was there, I said, I don't have my passport. He goes, what? Oh, brother, listen, I'll stay with you. And I said, go ahead and go across. I'll, you know. So I walked up to the guard, showed him my driver's license, told him I forgot my passport. He said, OK, go on through. It's not the passport. I want to got to keep that in mind. And also, it's not the weatherman who decides whether or not you can have an evangelistic meeting or not. It's God. We had, st I'm telling you folks, we prayed about storms coming, they looked terrible. And one storm just split in half like the Red Sea. <laughs> Came right across, a block and a half that way, it was flooding, and a block and a half that way, it was flooding. Where we were having a meeting, it was great. People, a whole bunch of people got saved. We had storms that come at us, stop, and go around like this. I'm telling you, it happened. God, and I, I mean, I go on about that. You got some of these people around here, I've heard these stories. Anyway, it's not that, that does, it's, it's God is the one who gets you through. God is the one who gets you there. He's the one who can get you through any problem. God is the one, not you, who has to move the mountain that's in your road. Don't, of course you can't move the mountain. God knows that. Why do you think he put it there? He put it there so that you will turn to him and learn to trust in him when you have a problem. First thing, God, not last thing, after you grumble and complain about everything and say, ah, oh, what am I going to do? It's what am I going to do? See, there's the problem. Let God do it. He can do anything. And uh, one of the last, the, let's see, the fifth one here I want to tell you is uh, when you have a trial or chastisement, something come into your life, don't blame God. That's the worst thing you can do. It's a foolish thing to do. Good night. Read John 3.16. What did he do for you? He loves you. What the problem is, is we don't understand. You know, the Bible talks about, and the Lord was talking about this, if, if your son asked for bread, would you give him a stone? If he asked for fish, would you give him a scorpion? No, because you're parents. You love the child. You try to give him those things. And, if, and he says, if we, who are, who are weak and are wicked, or do that for our son, wouldn't God do much more for us? We just don't understand. We, we complain to God because, because we don't understand what he's doing in our life when there's a bigger plan than just the little things going on in our life. Would, would, would you take your child and stick a pin in their arm to make them cry? No, you wouldn't do that. 
God wouldn't do that to you. It's just you need to trust God. So don't get angry with my. The other thing is, is don't pick out a person and get mad at them because usually God uses people to accomplish what he wants to do. He uses people. And you think, well, wasn't that person? I wouldn't have had a problem. Well, you know what's going to happen then? You have to go through it again because God is, is a good father and he's going to make sure you learn because he loves you. That's why he's going to make you go through it again, only the second time usually a little harder than the first one. Make it easy. Learn the first time. Now, I wanted to look at Matthew 17, 20, and then I'm going to close with this last um, story here. This is a, a verse now. Does everybody believe everything God says is true in this Bible? Good. Okay. Matthew 17, 20. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, because of your unbelief, they're asking a question there, and he says, For verily I say unto you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. Well, if you believe the Bible says truth, that should be true too, right? Shouldn't that be true? Now, some of you know what I'm getting at with this. It should be true, hey, because it is true. Now, it was a, a really good friend of mine. He was a, a missionary in uh, India. And he had an orphanage right on the, right on the coast. Uh, and it was a very hot, humid area there. And uh, there was a, well, it wasn't really a mountain, but it was this big, giant hill that was there. And it shaded the orphanage. Now, humidity and shade brings, uh, you know, because a problem there with, and so the kids were getting sick because of that, and the teachers were, would say, if it weren't for that mountain, we wouldn't have all this stuff growing and mushrooms and everything around the place. And they, they'd said that. Well, then, now this is a Christian orphanage. These kids, six, seven, eight years old, and started reading and read this verse. What do you think the kids said when they read this verse? Huh, all we got to do is pray. <laughs> Goodbye, mountain. They were excited. And the teachers were trying to talk them out of it. They were saying, well, uh, you know, uh, but God said it, and what God says is true, and God doesn't lie. Oh, why are you going to answer that when your kid says that to you? Yeah. So they started praying, God, get rid of this mountain. Nobody likes the mountain. Let's get rid of it, Lord. So they went on this field trip that took about five days. They came back at the end of the field trip, and the mountain was gone. <laughs> it wasn't there. You know what those kids did? They about knocked that bus apart. They were jumping, yes, God, that's a prayer to jump. The bus is rocking around, and the adults, oh, well, what happened here? Wait a minute, you know. You know adults are, they want to find a reason. They don't really want to. And so they uh, come to find out what's happened. The government was reclaiming land from the sea because they wanted to build some kind of radar thing out there. So they bulldozed this thing out into the sea and basically built, got another about two acres of land, and they were going to put something out there. But the kids didn't care how it got done. <laughs> they prayed. It's gone. God did it. What more is there to think about it? And it's interesting about something like that, because when God does something like that, he gives the opportunity to those who won't believe to say, it would have happened anyway. God had nothing to do with it. Man, don't let that, don't, every blessing comes from God. Every single one. We need to remember that. Remember, we have a God. He is a good God. He does good things. And he can move mountains. And I'm telling you, folks, let him move the mountain. You struggle your life trying to worry about mountains or even giving up when you see it. You look and see it. Oh, I can't do this. It just can't happen. It's too much. It, but not for God. He is a good God, and he loves you. You've got to trust him and put your faith in him and make those steps of faith and say, I don't know how he's going to do that, but I'm going to trust him to do it. I don't have to know how he, in fact, I don't care how he does it. If he gets it out of the way, I'm going to be happy. So I'm going to walk right toward it and watch and see what God's going to do and not give up just because it looks bad because that's what Satan wants you to do. We have a good God, folks. Let's trust him. Let's pray. Dear Lord in heaven, we, we love you so much, and we thank you for your mercy and for your goodness. We pray, Lord, that you would help us strengthen our weak faith, dear Lord, that would be strong for you. God, you are a good God. You do good things, and you're waiting for us simply to ask for your help. 
Help us to be strong, Lord. Help us to love you. Help us to trust you. And Lord, we'll thank you and give you, be careful to give you the glory for all things. In Jesus' dear name we pray. Amen. I want you to stay seated with your heads bowed for a moment, if you would, please. I wonder tonight as you listen to the message and the promises from God's Word and the real life answers to prayer and seeing God work in situations that you heard about tonight. I wonder how many folks tonight are saying, Preacher, I'm facing some things in my life. And I realize tonight, afresh and anew, that with God all things are possible and I got to stop looking at the situation I got to stop thinking about all the possibilities I got to stop thinking about the fear and I have to know that God can take care of this I wonder how many people would say the spirit of God stopped at my seat tonight and he ministered to my heart pastor pray for me this evening would you slip your hand up Christian say pastor God stopped at my seat tonight yes Amen. Amen. You may put them down. In a moment, I'm going to pray, and we're going to have our invitation. God has dealt with your heart. He's spoken to you. Now you need to respond to Him. You do that by bending a knee, coming to an altar, and responding to what He's told you to do. Why don't you give it to Him tonight? Why don't you just lay it on Him? Casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. With God, nothing shall be impossible. Father, thank you for speaking to hearts tonight. Thank you, Lord, for the encouragement, the challenge that's been given to us tonight from your word. And Father, I pray for decisions that have been made in hearts and some that need to be made and then sealed here at an altar. I pray, Lord, that you'd meet with us now in these next few minutes as we desire to see a God at work in our lives and we'd be aware of what you're doing in our lives. Increase our faith, please, as we wait on you this evening. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, stand to your feet if you would. As you stand, the pianist will play and Brother Bob's going to sing. God has spoken to your heart tonight. Respond to him now this evening and come while Bob sings. Oh, soul, are you weary That's right. and troubled? That's right. No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior. And life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace through death into life everlasting he passed and we follow him there over us sin no more had dominion for more than conquerors we are turn your eyes upon Jesus look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace his word shall not fail you, he promised. Believe him and all will be well. Then go to a world that is dying. 
His perfect salvation to tell. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in His wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of His glory and grace. tell the RU folks all the time we come together to focus on Jesus Christ we don't focus on the problem we focus on the solution and in any area of your life that's the right way to go yeah, the solution is God the solution is Jesus Christ and uh, what are you focused on uh, when you get to be discouraged when you get to be fearful when you get to be critical when you get what are you focusing on and uh, I'll guarantee you it's probably not Jesus if that's the case. So uh, turn your eyes upon him. Amen? Amen. Boy, I'm glad I came tonight. Amen. And uh, good, good service. Man, I enjoyed it. And uh, appreciate you being here. Great crowd Friday night. And uh, appreciate you being here in your place. All right? If anybody here tonight, you don't have a Bible. Anybody don't own a Bible? We've got some for you. Brother Moreland back there. Uh, has Bibles that he's willing to give to you. Uh, if you don't have one, you see Brother Moreland on the way out. He's a fellow right by the door there. The the Not the handsome one on the right, the handsome one on the left, okay? And uh, he's right there, and um, he'll make sure you get a Bible of your own. Everybody, we live in America, praise the Lord, and uh, if you want a Bible, you can have one. And uh, many places in the world, you can't say that. And uh, But thank God we can, and uh, got... Brother Moreland uh, has taken that on as a burden and a ministry, and so if you'd like one, he'll give you one tonight, and uh, just ask him for it, all right? Okay, let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Missionaries, we'll head down to their displays in the room, and uh, you stop in the room right across from the nursery and see them. Now listen, the nursery is going to be dismissing through the nursery door. Our RU children are going to be going in the three and four year old door. All right, we've got to have some. Our, they, they got to have some thing for the kids while we meet briefly with the RU folks over in the fellowship hall. All right, uh, so kind of make that flow if you can. Those of you getting children out of the nursery in and out, we'll try to keep the ones that were in there for church on the nursery side, and then RU kids will take over in the, the four and five year old Sunday school classroom. All right, that's kind of how it ought to work. Okay, and. Uh, those who work with the RU kids, you be down there if you would and be ready to receive them, and that would be great. Okay, and RU folks, after we pray, feel free to see the missionaries for a minute if you'd like. Uh, and if not, just head on into the fellowship hall. Brother Bob will be over there, and he'll direct you as to how we're going to make that work tonight, okay? Because I don't have a clue. All right? <laughs> Let's pray, shall we? Father, thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for a wonderful, wonderful night. It sure has been good to be in the house of the Lord this yeah. evening. Father, you, you, you spoke to our hearts tonight. You've challenged us. you encouraged us. Lord, I pray that we remember these principles, that we'd have them written down and keep them inside of our Bible and, and look at them regularly. Remind ourselves, Lord, that without faith it's impossible to please you. And Lord, thank you that you're a rewarder of those who diligently seek you. And so, Lord, help us to trust you in every area of our life. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. Watch over us as we go to our different places this evening. Father, I pray that you'll bless the activities of the morning. 
as we go down and participate in this parade and we give out your word. I pray, Lord, that it will accomplish what it is sent out to do, that we'll hear results of people who have received Christ because of this or folks who've been seeking, and uh, this will be an answer to their prayer. And I pray you'll bless the efforts that we, as we give out your word tomorrow morning, and we'll thank you for it. Give us a good Saturday, and then bring us back for our international dinner and our service tomorrow night. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, oh, we didn't sing Bury My Heart yet, did we? Let's do that now, all right? It's in your bulletin. Bury My Heart in the Mission Field. Brother Bob's going to lead us. We'll sing it through twice and then put that ending on that you did last night. Okay, you got that? All right, let's sing that together for our dismissal song, okay? Bury my heart on the Mission Field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to the suffering one. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Lord, please bury my heart. Bury my heart on the mission field, Lord. I'll give the gospel to the suffering ones. I'll go wherever you want me to go. Lord, please bury my heart. Lord, I'll give you my heart. Amen. You're dismissed. Are you? We'll see you over.